Welcome inside this edition of Big Ten Today. Rick Pizzo, Trent Meacham alongside for the next 60 minutes. Hard to believe four weeks from Wednesday, the start of the Big Ten tournament right here in Chicago. And as you hearken back to your playing days, I'm sure this last month is both exciting because of everything that's at stake, but it's also a grind, man. It's been wearing you down for the last couple of months. you got to find some extra energy when these big-time matchups come up. Yeah, I really liken this time to separation season. Right here, these, these couple weeks here, you're not quite at the finish line. Most teams are banged up, and it can be a grind right now, especially here in the Midwest. It's dark and cold, so this is a, a period of time. We're going to get into it. What teams can maybe separate themselves over the next few weeks? Well, those are the knowns, the commodities that you know you have to deal with, but every now and then throw a monkey in the wrench and you get something that you absolutely did not expect to come and we got that earlier this week Minnesota and Illinois scheduled to play on Tuesday but your big story as it continues to develop the Gophers unable to go because of COVID and safety protocols within the Minnesota program Minnesota and Illinois unable to play on Tuesday now the Gophers had sent this out on Monday, said they'll work with the conference to reschedule the game. Well, it happened really quickly because we can tell you that that postponed game has already been rescheduled. It will be played on Monday, February the 20th at 8 Central, 9 o'clock Eastern. So you look at the schedule shortened down from three games to two this evening. Rutgers, Indiana will preview that game in just a bit. Remember, Rutgers absolutely ran them out of the gym when they played at Jersey Mike's earlier this year. Very different Indiana team right now. Maryland and Michigan State, suddenly the Terps are one of the hottest teams inside the Big Ten. Be interesting to see how they do on the road. They have been a much better team at home, though the most recent game on the road was a 35-point win against Minnesota. Let's start with that developing story and no matchup tonight for Minnesota and Illinois how does it affect these two teams? Let's start with the Illini, a team that obviously is in contention for a double bye, and now you're looking at having to make up a game and jam it into the back end of your schedule closer and closer to the postseason. Yeah, the schedule is definitely backloaded, but you can look at it one of two ways. Now you have this unexpected week-long break here in early February. Is this some time for your team to you know, get in there, get rehab, uh, get your body feeling right, but also maybe you can implement a few wrinkles into what you're doing schematically. Do you really do that in February, though? Well, I think you definitely can. I think a lot of coaches maybe sometimes even hold things back because they want to introduce maybe a few new plays, maybe um, try a different look as you get down to the stretch. Because, look, these coaches, these teams are scouting you so heavily. They know everything that you're running at this point. So now you have some time. You want to take advantage of that. See if you can implement maybe it's something, a, a scheme, a tweak defensively to, to give a different look to someone. You're going to play TJD again. He just went for 30-something on you. Can you do something different? And then offensively, maybe you incorporate a few new plays. Illinois, they changed how they played offensively midseason. So now they have some time to actually practice. you got to look at the, at the positives, do that. I think also from a shooting perspective, this team is at the bottom of the league under 30% from threes, you get in the, in the gym, get reps in, and can you turn this into a positive? I think it's more on the defensive side. You mentioned TJD. Obviously, Iowa had a really nice offensive game against Illinois, though Iowa has really nice offensive games <laughs> against a lot of teams. As for Minnesota, trying to find the positive in what has been a year that's been devoid of many positives. They've had so many injuries. Maybe this gives them a chance to get Dawson Garcia back, a guy who is really key to any kind of success that they may have late in the year. Yeah, I heard Ben Johnson say you can't speed up recovery, right? These injuries, and it just takes time. And, and hopefully, you know, if Dawson Garcia is back, Braden Carrington, I think, has a little bit more time. But maybe both those guys are back by February 20th. And this is, especially with Garcia, it's a different team. It's a much more capable team. When you insert that leading scorer, now Jamison Battle can play off him. Now Talon Cooper can set up those guys better and doesn't have to have so much load on his shoulders to score. So this could go from a team that's really reeling in the wrong direction, maybe get fresh emotionally, mentally, have a break, and be a da more dangerous team once they're back if they can get healthy. Again, no Minnesota and Illinois on Tuesday as originally scheduled. That game has been rescheduled. It will be played on Monday, February the 20th. As for the two games that will be played on Tuesday night, let's start with Rutgers-Indiana because the Hoosiers come off the biggest win of the year for their program, one of the biggest wins by anybody in the country this year, knocked off the in-state rival and then still number one Purdue. But this Rutgers team, if you recall, back in early conference play, just shut down Indiana. Now, I use a different team. Jalen Huchifino is a different guy. He replaces Xavier Johnson. I'm interested to see how Indiana responds, not just to the Rutgers loss, but it's not easy sometimes to come back and keep energy after you beat number one. That's a, that's a great point. You know, I, I watched Duke 
last night get blown out by 20 after they beat their rival in North Carolina on Saturday. How does Indiana respond? Now, Indiana thankfully doesn't have to go on the road. I think that helps playing at home. That should really help them. Here's the thing. With both these teams, you know, I don't question Rutgers' toughness at all. I mean, I do not question that. I can question, can they keep up with Indiana offensively? Uh, I, I don't think they're going to hold Indiana to 48 points like they did in early December. For Indiana, okay, I don't question their talent. They have top-end talent. I think they have multiple NBA players. But I question right now, okay, how mentally tough. How mentally tough they are, as you alluded to. Can they respond after this emotional game? I mean, you beat number one, your rival. Everybody's been talking about Purdue all year. The, the, the fans stormed the court. So how do you respond to that? That's what's so hard to do, to be consistent day in, day out. And you, you talk about handling adversity. I think handling success is sometimes harder to do, and they just were at the pinnacle knocking down number one. Can you get back to it just a few days later? It should be fun Here, to see. Here's why I think they can, and I think this is why I look at this Indiana team differently than I've looked at Indiana teams in the past that Trace Jackson Davis has been on. He's a different guy. And I don't mean his ability to score. I don't mean his defensive ability. I mean his attitude. Yeah. He looks like a guy who has an edge, who has an edge that he's never had before. I'm not sure if you saw, but early in that game against Purdue, there was a slight altercation underneath the basket. He went chest to chest and bumped Mason Gillis. He was yeah. the aggressor. Now, he didn't get called for a tee and probably didn't deserve it. But I think the fact that he has changed who he is in terms of his aggressiveness and being a person, not just a player, I think it's a huge benefit. I think it changes this team. I wrote down something here. I said, different TJD. Yeah, he is. And, He's and, a different guy. And, and you, you nailed it right there. You don't typically see your star player step into those moments. That's where you kind of want, if you're a coach, you want someone that isn't your go-to guy to step in and, and, and go chest to chest and not back down. But I tell you what, when, you're, when your best player does that, your leader, your most experienced guy – I mean, that does something to the rest of your team. And I thought almost single-handedly in that game, Trace Jackson Davis, he got 17,000 fans, you know, with him. That first half, I mean, that, that place was just – the energy in there was just about unmatched yeah. from what I've seen. And you can – and that's because of Trace Jackson Davis. So he's a different player. And, and from the first matchup, too, he wasn't quite 100%, so he's a different player now. He's playing at such a high level, not just from his production standpoint, but his, his attitude is – is, is next level. His leadership is great. And then we've seen Jalen hood Shafino just come on this season. Uh, so I, I think the question marks for Indiana will be how do they handle their pressure? Xavier Johnson really struggled in that first game with Rutgers pressure. You know they're going to come at hood Shafino. What I, I did like seeing when Purdue picked up their pressure, okay, in ball screen situations. We kind of talked about when Zach Eady's playing, they're in a drop coverage. But when Eady was out, they blitzed him in ball screens. And I thought hood Shafino made good decisions, got that quick um, – uh, you know, uh, pocket pass down to his big man. So I think that's a question mark. How do they handle pressure and how do they rebound? And then for Rutgers, can they somewhat contain TJD and knock down some shots? Yeah, they're going to need a big game offensively, I think, from Paul Mulcahy, who continues to provide Rutgers with basically everything it needs. For my money right now, I think Coach Shafino is now the freshman of the year over Bryce Sensabaugh. We'll discuss that okay. a little bit later because I think you may disagree, but we'll get into freshman of the year and defensive player of the year you. coming up in just a little bit. Maybe you will. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, Maryland and Michigan State. This is intriguing to me because just a few weeks ago, we said, well, Maryland's great at the Xfinity Center, but on the road, eh, they're okay. Now, I know Minnesota right now is limited and their 35-point win maybe needs to be judged fairly more so than being ready to say Maryland's a road team. But I start to look at the chemistry. I start to look at what they appear to be as a whole team right now. It's not just Jameer Young. It's Dante Scott. It's Julian Reese. It's Hakeem Hart. It's Don Carey. It's Patrick Emelian. I mean, all of these guys are now contributing. I think Maryland suddenly becomes a really dangerous out home or away. I agree. I will say I'm taking kind of a wait-and-see approach because they're st still on the season, Rick. They're two road wins are at Louisville and at Minnesota. So I think they're, they're a capable team on the, on the road. I think they're going to have some good road wins, but they really haven't proved it yet. Let's start with the backcourt, though, because I think this game, you're going to see the best backcourt in the country or in, in the Big Ten Conference in Tyson Walker and A.J. Hogart. I think the Spartans have the best, best backcourt back in, in the conference. Yeah, yeah. I did the rundown a few weeks ago. You, you, maybe you didn't see. I think they're the best backcourt in the conference. Wow. Okay. They got experience. Both those guys produce against the best guard not named Jalen Pickett and Jameer Young. And I said this on Saturday, we were in here. Jameer Young, to me, is, is a 
He's the guard version of Trace Jackson Davis. You know, extremely quick and explosive lefty that just puts so much pressure on opposing defenses, impossible to keep out of the paint. And with that left hand, very effective finishing in the paint. I love how he's playing. And then you mentioned other pieces that fall in around him. But I think that backcourt matchup is going to be really intriguing. I think the forward matchup between Dante Scott and Joey Hauser, two of the most versatile guys going back and forth, I think that's going to be fun to watch as well. Best backcourt in the Big Ten in East Lansing, huh? I think so. I think so. Look at Michigan State. Okay, they've lost five of seven. Look at, let's look at their losses. Two of those are against Purdue. Another at Illinois, at Indiana, at Rutgers. They've had a brutal schedule. They, they've had one of the okay. hardest, if not the hardest I, I think those two guys, they got experience. They can get it done offensively. Um, A.J. Hogard's maybe the best passer in the league. So I really like that backcourt. Look, there's, there's other good ones. Penn State's great. Indiana's great. I think if, especially if Xavier – Purdue's David young Johnson guys back, are great. Purdue's great. So there's a lot of good ones. But I think Michigan State right now so, is the best backcourt. you know the old adage, guard play wins in yes, March. Yes, yes. So you believe this Michigan State team is built for March? I do. I do. Th- this is a totally, – I mean, I'm putting words in Trent's yeah, mouth this, right now. But. This, is, this is a totally different Michigan State team than we've seen. They're not that big, physical. They won't beat you up on the boards. Okay, I did like they out rebounded Rutgers on Saturday. But here's what I think. they got to get out and run more. They're like 300th in the com- I country agree with in that. tempo. they got to push the ball more because what they are is they're very skilled. they got those two guards. I think Tom Izzo could put the ball in, in Tyson Walker's hands a little bit more. He's playing almost totally off the ball. I'd like to see him have the ball in his hands a bit more. But with Joey Hauser and Malik Hall back, this team's skilled. They can spread the floor. So I'd like to see them push the tempo more. Spartans in search of a fourth straight win against Maryland, the best backcourt in the conference, taking on the Terps tonight Should be in good one. East Lansing. Of course, that Thursday game is in Bloomington, but our big interview takes us to Iowa City as we say hello to Hannah Stolke, outstanding freshman for the Iowa Hawkeyes. Hannah, before we get into the game, Let's get the folks to know a little bit more about you. You grew up in Iowa. You said you always knew that you wanted to play for the Hawkeyes. How has the reality compared to the dream? Um, Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, It's amazing playing with such amazing girls. Um, Caitlin, obviously, is uh, stellar. She's really good. Um, But um, it's really awesome to have your dreams come true and um, be able to live that every day. You committed... After your freshman year of high school, you were the top scorer in the state as a freshman that year. But I know you received interest from other schools. At least three schools in the Big Ten had reached out to you during your freshman year. Did you ever give any consideration to going anywhere else? Um, not really. Um, I knew this is where I wanted to be, and I made the choice. So tell me a little bit about your official visit. What was your official visit like? Who hosted you? Um, well, all the coaches were there. Um, we stayed in a hotel, went to some a football game. Um, it was a lot of fun getting to know the girls, and it was really special. It felt just like a family. So, Coming in, you were the player of the year. You were Iowa Miss Basketball. Do you feel any extra pressure to perform knowing what the expectations were on you from the outside? Um, I don't. Um, the girls make it really easy to come in and um, just play your role, just do what you can. And um, yeah, Caitlin gives me a lot of confidence. Kate is a great role model. Um, they make it really easy. Okay, so you say that the key for you is to play your role. How do you define your role on this team? Um, I think just to work hard, um, run the court. We, we let, like to get out and up. Um, and I love to run, so I do that. Obviously, you're a great athlete. You were a multi-sport athlete in high school. How did playing multiple sports kind of prepare you for playing just basketball at such a high level in college? Um, I played volleyball for all my four years of high school, um, which really helped with my vertical. (laughs) Um, And then track, of course, um, really got me in shape for the next level. And I know you said you lean on your mom for everything, both on and off the court. She was an outstanding basketball player in her own right. What has she meant to you and your development, both as a person and as a basketball player? Um, She means everything to me. Um, She's super supportive. She always knows what to say. She knows the game, so she can always help me when I need it. 
Take me inside the locker room and share a little bit about the relationship between yourself and other young players on this team with the veterans, with girls like Caitlin and Monica Mm -hmm. and Kate Martin, some of the other players that you mentioned who've been around this program for a while. Um, They make sure to take you under their wing. Um, They make you feel comfortable. It's like a big family, like I said. Um, And they're really supportive of everything. They're amazing. So when you're watching, whether you're on the floor or whether you're taking a few moments on the bench, what is the one thing that Caitlin Clark does that still blows you away, even though you see her every day in practice? Oh, my God. Pretty much everything. Um, (laughs) When she just comes over half court and pulls up, I'm like, (laughs) wow. Wow. She's amazing. And the crazy crazy thing is, when she pulls up from the logo, most of the time, you know that it's going in. But I want you to hear what she said about you if you haven't heard this already. And this is straight quote. I think Hannah doesn't know how good she can be. Her potential is through the roof. I think everybody on our team knows this. What does that make you feel like when the National Player of the Year has that to say about your game? Um, it makes me think a lot. Um, to think that she believes in me that much, it's a big confidence boost, obviously. But um, yeah, it's really cool. She is obviously not the only star on this team. Monica Sonano probably gets overlooked and overshadowed a lot because of the numbers that Caitlin puts up. When you guys think about what is really important to the success of your team, how does Monica play into that? Oh, Monica is a huge part of our success. Um, I don't think we could do it without her. She she um, does a lot for this team more than just what the stats say. Um, She's a great player. Yes, she most certainly is. She's missed double-double. I know Caitlin has missed triple-double, but it's never bad (laughs) to have both. As you get set for Thursday night, I know you're still a couple of days away, and there's practice to worry about, and there's school to worry about in between. What's the feeling like? You've already taken down three AP Top 10 teams this year. You have a chance for number four on Thursday night. um, We're excited. Um, Indiana's an amazing team. Um, But we're ready for them. We're going to go in there do our best and hopefully we can get number four under our belt what is the key to a win against this indiana team that i know you guys have obviously been scouting already and are very familiar with um i think keeping our composure is really important um they're a really fundamentally sound team and we've got to stay headstrong and um be ready for them all right, women's basketball fans, keep that name fresh in your minds. Hannah Stolke, I mean, Caitlin Clark says she's going to be really good, doesn't even know how good she can be, and she's got plenty of time to do so in Iowa City. Hannah, we truly appreciate the time. Wish you the best of luck, not just Thursday, but the rest of the season. And thanks so much for being with us on Big Ten today. Yes, thank you. Nice win on Saturday night for Ohio State over Penn State with the split against the Nittany Lions. Buckeyes ending the weekend 17-10-1 overall, two games above 500 in the Big Ten. We don't really worry that much about records, certainly not rankings right now. We focus on the pairwise because that's all that matters when it comes to getting into the NCAA tournament. Right now, Ohio State comfortably at number eight. There are four Big Ten teams inside the top ten of the current pairwise, led by Minnesota, who sits at the top of the country at number one. Time for us to check in with Ohio State's Jake Wise, second on the team in points, also one of the top face-off men in the entire country. We'll get into that in just a little bit. Jake and I off camera had some uh, old school moments talking about Boston as well. He's a Massachusetts guy. Uh, Before we get into that kind of stuff, Jake, I want to talk about this past weekend and how big it was on Saturday for you guys to pick up that win and avoid being swept at home. Yeah, I mean, that was that was so huge. Uh, it's a tough weekend. Penn State's such a good team. So we knew it was going to be a, a huge weekend, especially coming off the bye. And uh, that win Saturday, it, w- it was massive for us. What's the grind been like this year? I know grind is a term that hockey guys like to use a lot. But in this league, as we just pointed out, looking at the pairwise, there are four teams that are almost certainly going to make the NCAA tournament. We could see five. And if some crazy stuff happens, you could have six out of seven teams in the league qualify for the NCAAs what's it been like weekend to weekend yeah I mean it's it's 
the best league in college hockey, I think, this year, right? So uh, every weekend we know we have to be at our best, and, our, and any team can beat anyone. I mean, we went we went into Wisco and we lost. Like, they're such a good team, too. And so it's it's been a tough year, and I think we've done a really good job of, of just staying consistent throughout the year, and I think that's kind of been our M.O. What's the best version of this Ohio State team? In, in, in other words, what's happening on the ice when you guys are playing at your best? Um, it's when we're just playing unselfish. I mean, Coach Rollick does a great job of, of instilling that, like, we play the right way by just getting pucks pucks deep and, like, working their D and, and not playing selfish hockey. I think when, when we're not playing great, we kind of – we turn pucks over at the blue line. We make it a run and gun game. But when we when we get pucks in deep, we're working the D and holding on to pucks in the O zone. I think that's when you see us at our best. I want you to take me now inside the faceoff circle. We have 346 faceoffs won, I believe. I mean, that's a career for a lot of guys. You're fifth in all of D1. You lead the Big Ten. So what's the secret sauce to being a really good draw guy? <laughs> I don't I was never I was never great it was something that I wanted to work on this summer and I guess it paid off but I think it's it's coach Rollick trusting me and putting me out there so many face-offs I think that's that's part of it and then I mean we, we work a lot on face-offs especially after practice coach Bittner and and Lane the bell he's out there dropping pucks as many as we want so sometimes we'll be out there for like 20 minutes all the centers just working on face-offs and yeah, I mean, it's also the wingers, too. If, if my wingers aren't helping me out there, sometimes uh, I can get into some trouble. So it's, it's, been a, it's been a good year in the dot, for sure. Obviously, a lot of work goes into it, but I'm sure a lot of studying goes into it as well. Is there anybody that you look at, whether it's in the college game or at the NHL level, who's a really good draw guy who you try to emulate or who you try to steal some stuff from? Yeah, there, there's a lot of guys. I mean, and it's it's interesting because so many guys take faceoffs differently. But um, I think right now Johnny Taze is number one in in faceoffs. So um, I've, I've watched him a lot for sure. Bergeron is he's consistently up there in the top of the league. So um, it's it's always just trying to pick up some different things that that guys do because, like I said, everyone does them different. So you kind of want to bring what you can into your game. I joked around that we found out before we started the interview that we lived in buildings basically right next to each other on Com Ave when I was there in the late 90s and when you were playing at BU. I, I know that most guys who grow up playing youth and high school hockey in Massachusetts dream of playing for either BU or BC. You ended up with the Terriers, but things didn't really pan out. Why? Yeah, I mean, it, it was tough. It definitely wasn't, wasn't the best few years. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's exactly one answer that I can say as why it didn't pan out, but um, I'm just so happy I got the opportunity here, and um, I, like, I love this place, so it's, it's been great here. And I know you, ha you did have to deal during your time at BU, during your time as a high schooler, I believe, as well, with some, with some injuries. You had a clavicle. You had a labrum. What's the toughest part of dealing with injuries when you want to get back on the ice? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess the, I, I forgot about those. I could be part of the reason why it didn't work out great. But I mean, injuries are they're, they're all part of the game. I think the the biggest thing is like you just really have to stick with it. And um, for me, it was tough. Like when I I broke the clavicle like the year before, like my before I got to school, and then my freshman year I got the labrum, and it was kind of like really like back to back. So. Um, it's really just staying in a good mindset and, and knowing that like you're you're gonna get better and you're gonna get back to it and um, knock on wood I've been healthy so far since then so hopefully we can keep that going. I love to hear you talk about the decision to go to Ohio State. You said first it felt like a weight was lifted off, but also that at the very first call with the coaches, you fell in love with those guys. Why? Yeah, I mean literally the first, and uh, it's so funny because. Um, if you were to ask me kind of before when I was younger, like there was no way I'd ever wanted to play anywhere outside of Boston. And, um, I, and I, I get on the phone with the Ohio State guys and I'm, and I'm sold in two minutes. So um, Coach Rollick, Coach Bittner, uh, it was actually Coach Miller too, who's at Minnesota now. They were, they were so great. And I think the biggest thing was, was like they really believed in my game and um, I felt that I could help out the team as well. So. He just, Coach Rolich said he just wanted to get me back to playing with confidence, and that's really all I needed to hear. I've known Steve for a long time as well, and when folks from the outside maybe are just watching, Rawls looks so stoic 
on the bench, doesn't really make a big deal out of everything, just goes about his business. Take us behind the scenes. What's he like in the team room? Yeah, he's he's great. I mean, he uh, he has his moments where he, he never really snaps at us, which is which is good. He's he is really stoic in that in that sense. But he's he's actually really high energy, like day in day out. Like he's bringing the energy. He probably has the most energy out of all of us in practice. So he's great. He's so he's so great. Actually, I think all the, he has so much respect in the locker room. And I think that's that's what you need out of a head coach. Yeah, it never hurts when you're an outstanding player like he was during his college days as well. Uh, he obviously was a key element in naming you, being part of a captain of this team. What did that mean to you? Yeah, it was a huge honor. Um, I mean, it was it was definitely a tough stretch before a couple like like at BU the, the three years. So that was definitely something that that meant a lot. And I'm obviously so thankful for Coach Rollick, my teammates, and and everyone here and for trusting me to, to be the captain. All right, Jake, let's get you out of here on this one. You have Notre Dame on the road this weekend. You split with them in Columbus, and it was a weird series because you're able to score five on Friday night, but they shut you out in game two, which is kind of more of Notre Dame's MO. What's the scouting report on the Irish for this weekend? Yeah, I mean, I think Notre Dame is a team that they, they're so consistent in how they play. I mean, they're they're going to shut you down. They, they play really hard, so... Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a lot, a lot of work for us to, to break down their D and, and get pucks through. So uh, we'll definitely remember the, the last weekend, that's for sure. Okay, I lied to you because I, I do have one more. Because I, I know players don't like to look ahead, so I'm not going to ask you to preview the game that you have with Michigan, but there's got to be some cool excitement about the atmosphere and what it's going to be like to be playing in a completely different environment at First Energy Stadium with the face-off on the lake. Yeah, yeah, I mean... I remember so clearly, like it was literally, I think our first or second workout this year and um, Coach Rollick comes in and it was kind of like an impromptu meeting. No one really knew what was going on. He was like, so um, uh, the Cleveland Browns owner reached out to Ohio State and they want to do an outdoor game. And we all kind of look at each other like really, like no way. And now that it's finally here and, and it's against Michigan, like one of the biggest rivalries in, in all of college, it, it's going to be so fun. And kind of getting back to the roots of, of hockey, playing outside. I mean, I don't think many of us have got the chance to do that. So uh, we're all so excited. It's going to be an awesome weekend. Oh, it's been great to catch up with Ohio State captain Jake Wise. Jake, wish you the best of luck the rest of the season. Look forward to seeing you guys, not just in the Big Ten tournament, but in the NCAA tournament as well. Thanks for spending some time with us today here on Big Ten Today. Yeah, thank you so much. Trent Meacham back with us, and we will go through each of those teams as they sit currently in the tiebreaker scenario. You have to go to page 94 in the Big Ten tiebreakers to get through a six-way tiebreaker, but as of right now, Iowa actually has the tiebreaker over all of those teams. They play at Purdue next, at the number one team in the country. But I got to tell you, what this team can do offensively, you don't expect 32 from Tony Perkins every day. I get it. But the options that this team has offensively, Trent, they're actually the best offensive efficiency team in the nation when they play at home. Yeah, and I think with them and Purdue are tied at number one, as, mo as the, the best offenses in the country. So pretty cool to have two Big Ten teams up there. And here's the thing. You talked about the options. You just don't know who's it going to be. It could be Peyton Sanford going for 20 in one half. We saw what Tony Perkins could do. Even Aaron Euless came out of, like, the Woodward out of nowhere and, you know, 15 points, 16 points. Obviously, Chris Murray can get buckets. I think Patrick McCaffrey's only going to get better as this season unfolds. Connor has too. become a more capable three-point shooter. He's having his best season yet, so Rebracha has improved. So you look at this team, you think about how they performed at the end of last season. And, of course, Keegan Murray's not there. But to a man, I think every other player is better on this roster. They've all made improvements. So this team's really dangerous. What I love, though, most about them is they dictate the terms. You know, when I was playing, it doesn't matter. They played Rutgers twice. Northwestern, Illinois, Maryland, all these teams are really good defensively. They dropped, they hung 93 yeah. on Rutgers last time. And they just get you playing their brand of basketball. I, I've watched some games, and it seems like, okay, the other team's having some success. It's going back and forth. But it's just a matter of time before their offensive you know, um, power just kind of takes over and other teams can't catch up. Interesting thing about Iowa Rutgers, the Scarlet Knights are giving up about 57 points per game to everybody on their schedule not named yeah. Iowa. Iowa averages more than 85 in those two meetings. So it just goes to show you how dangerous this team can be offensively. But you can see on the screen, three of their next four 
on the road against Purdue. Minnesota, right now, you would say, and no disrespect, they're the one game that I think folks look at and say that's the easy W on the schedule. You do have to travel to Northwestern, a Wildcat team that is also in that mix at 7-5. and five. So that's what's coming up for Iowa. Next on the tiebreaker scenario sheet among this sixth-place tie would be Michigan. And the Wolverines have Nebraska next, then Indiana. The good news about that Indiana game, it's at home. Trent, I love when Hunter Dickinson is assertive and aggressive. He was last time. When he is that guy down low, Michigan's really good. When he takes five or six shots, this becomes a team that is just much easier to defend. They really need to establish him, and that's going to be a really good match if you think of the two lefties inside and, and Dickinson TJD. And, and Jackson Davis and very, very different players. So that's going to be a great matchup. This team offensively, too, they're number two in the conference in conference play and scoring. So they, they've really emerged as an offensive team. And, of course, Dickinson, he's the focal point. But I like their backcourt. Kobe Bufkin, Doug McDaniel, they're playing really well. So Doug McDaniel, freshman, he has a 3-1 to one assist-to-turnover ratio in conference play. Bufkin, 2-1. to one. I thought that game against Northwestern, they go up against a very experienced, one of the better backcourts, I think, in our conference, really, in Chase Audige and Boo Booey. And those two guys, for a young guy like McDaniel, did not score in that game, but nine assists, zero turnovers. That speaks volumes. Kobe Bufkin almost had a triple-double, 15-12-8. Uh, and eight. So those two guys, along with Hunter Dickinson, you know Jet Howard can fill it up. I mean, this is a good team that's you know really surging at the right moment. I agree. I like this Michigan team right now. I like this lineup that they have. I like Doug McDaniel uh, yes. getting more run. I like Kobe Bufkin being a guy who feels obviously much more confident. He feels like when he has to, he can run the show. And we've seen Jet Howard can go for 34. Yeah. Now, he hasn't quite done that since the injury, but we'll see if he's back to 100% again. Not really a lot of matchups that you like if you have to play against this Michigan team, regardless of what the makeup is on your own team. Of course, Maryland and Michigan split this year. Remember, Michigan ran him out of the building the first time, and then the Terps came back and got revenge. We've discussed Maryland a little bit. You're still in a wait-and-see mode <laughs> on the road. Obviously, you'll probably get a pretty big answer later tonight when they take on Michigan State, but you start to look at that schedule. If they can get past Michigan State, they have Penn State at home. They'll be a favorite. They'll have Nebraska on the road. If Maryland goes 3-1 and one in this stretch and they're looking at 10-6 and six with four games left to play, I think you book them to have a first-round bye at the Big Ten Tournament, be, which is something we would not have said a month ago. They'd be in great position. I didn't give you my records for these next four games, but I, would, I have Maryland 2-2 two and two in these next okay. four games. So that's where I have them. You have them losing I, to I Michigan am, State and I, Purdue. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I say wait and see just because they haven't really proved to beat a good team on the road. I definitely think they're capable. What I really like about Maryland is they know, they know their identity. This is an experienced group. The pieces seem to fit. They've already worked through a really tough spot, spot in the yep. season. I mean, this is a team that really that started great. Undefeated early on in the conference season before those first two conference games. Big win over Miami. Uh, St. Louis is a good ball club. Uh, got a good, good win against Illinois at home. And then, you know, UCLA just ran them out the gym, and it seemed like they just kind of went to a tailspin from there. But they've emerged. You see the confidence come back. I love what they do defensively. Some teams, you know, just stick to what they do. And, and, and of course, you want your principles. But Kevin Willard, he has them changing up their defenses. And they could be playing 94 feet of pressure. They could be playing zone. Sometimes they'll start in, in a zone or man and then switch mid-possession. I love that. And with that experienced group, they're able to be disciplined and still execute what they want to do. I think Kevin Willard is doing a terrific yeah. job in his first year in College Park. Never easy to come in your first year. Had a bunch of different parts, transfers, new guys, veteran guys. He's done a nice job of keeping that team together. And now look where they are. They're at 7-5, and five, like everybody else in the world. <laughs> like Northwestern at 7-5. Yeah. and five. So the Wildcats finished that six-game in 13-day stretch by going 4-2. and two. They swept Wisconsin, bookends first in Evanston and then in Madison over the course of the weekend. I think you can make an argument, as great as Matt Painter and Steve Peichel have been this year, I think you can make a legitimate argument for Chris Collins as Big Ten Coach of the Year. Oh, for sure. I think what they've done with what they lost and to change their identity um, to be in a really defensive-minded team is, is – I don't think anybody expected that with that roster. And I look at a, you know, this is similar to Maryland is they have a known identity. They know who they are. They know where the ball needs to go to offensively. It's going to be gone, gone through Chase Audige and Boo Booey. They're going to have a high usage rate. The other pieces fit in well behind them. I think even guys like Brooks Barnheiser, um, Martinelli has kind of come on recently. Another big, I like Barnheiser a yeah, lot, by big, the way. Those are two big physical wings. And talking about another physical presence, Matt Nicholson, I think he gets – 
kind of knocked for his, his inability to, you know, to really produce much offensively, but he's the anchor of their defense. He uses his size well. I really like this team, and maybe the most important thing is I just I feel like they're hungry. They're really hungry to prove people wrong. This is Bowie and Audis. This is their last go-around, and they want to get it done. They, they have a sense of urgency, and I think that bodes well for them down the stretch. I think they have to beat Ohio State and Columbus. That's their next game up because the next three after that, they're all at home. That's the great news. The bad news, tough one. Yeah. Purdue, Iowa, Indiana. Actually, Indiana is before Iowa, but that is a really tough I have them going two stretch. and two in there. That's all right. Stretch, yeah. well, I, I think they take two and two I think in that would, stretch, yeah. to be dead honest with you. Okay, let's focus now on Indiana. Focus. This is a really dangerous yes. team. I'll, I'll say this right now, and I know Purdue fans are going to hate me for it. If you gave me the chance right now to take Purdue or Indiana, not knowing who their opponents are going to be, not knowing what their seeds are going to be in the NCAA tournament, I think I'd take Indiana straight wow. up to go farther. Wow. I like the makeup of this team. I don't know that I trust young guards in the tournament if a team does a decent enough job on Zach Eady. And I think Indiana showed the, the formula. Give him 33 and 18. You don't let the other guys beat you. I love what Mike Woods is doing with this team right now. Well, I really like this team. I don't know if I'd go that far, but I, I, I would say I think this Hoosiers ball club has the ability to go as far as anyone in March. Okay, I think Purdue, I, I don't think those freshmen play like freshmen, so I don't really even categorize them as freshmen, but there's some concerns there. Indiana, though, um, when you look at their top end talent, when you look at the, you know, the NBA, I think, caliber uh, players when TJD, Jalen hood Shafino, I think they have that probably more so than any other team in the league. I think that bodes well for them on Mar- in March. Trace Jackson Davis is on a mission. I mean, just, I mean, this is his fourth year. Um, he hasn't had the, the team successes he liked. You know, this season they, they kind of had battled through some injuries, still, still are. He wasn't 100% at certain points of the season. And he is just on a total mission. So I love, um, I love that. I love how they bought into the defensive end. I think the big question mark for them will be Xavier Johnson. He's always kind of been an X factor for them, right? An emotional, talented guy. Hopefully he, he's able to come back. When, if he does, how do him and Jalen hood Shafino coexist in the backcourt? I think it could work out really well. But I think it can actually take some pressure off both those guys. Could. But that could take some – can they get the rhythm can they do before the chemistry March comes right. around? Yeah, yes. it'd be interesting. You know, Rayfield Davis always loves to say pros win in March. Indiana's got some pros on they this do. team. And finally, your alma mater, Illinois, a team much like Indiana. Mm-hmm. Their ceiling when they play really well is as high as anybody in this league. They're another team, the, the, the talent, the depth. They've had a favorable schedule in the they Big have. Ten. That's if fair. they didn't have those big wins in the non-conference, UCLA, Texas – I would really have some question marks because so far their, their road wins are Minnesota, Nebraska, Wisconsin. That's it. They've yeah. lost in the Penn State. They've lost to Indiana at home. So in conference play, they've been a little bit up and down. This team, though, seems like they're emerging at a good time. They have maybe the most weapons, aside, I think, them in Iowa, of guys that can emerge and score. I mean, even in recent games, Jay Epps averaging almost 14 a game over the last four. Dane Danger showed some moments where he can really produce – the, the Matt tan- Meyer can beat well, you in oh, every yeah. different way. I, I think Matt – I mean, Terrence Shannon was kind of started the season so well. And is he the go-to guy? I think he's a guy that in moments really just can just beat you up with his athleticism. But Meyer's a guy that's just crazy talented and gets you a bucket. And he's a mismatch so. nightmare in the tournament. There's just teams that don't have anybody oh, to match up with them. So I, I love just the, the, the overall depth of talent and scoring ability. But I think the question, can they defend consistently – and then move the ball shared offensively. If so, they can beat anyone. And right now they are number six among those six (laughs) teams in terms of the tiebreaker scenarios. Of course, that will change day by day as we finish the rest of the Big Ten season over the course of the next three and a half weeks. A few more minutes on Big Ten today with Rick Pizzo and Trent Meacham. Let's go to buy or sell. Very simple, defensive player of the year. Are you buying or selling Rutgers' Kayla McConnell repeating as the Big Ten's defensive player of the year? I might disappoint Rafael because I know that's his guy, but I'm, I'm selling this. Okay, as much as I love McConnell and, and, and Rutgers is probably the best defensive team, you also have, I mean, is he the best defensive player on their, on their team? I think Omori is really the, the anchor for their defense. But I would say three guys that really have emerged to me, and that's Chase Audige. He's been a catalyst to Northwestern's change, leads the conference in steals and Zach Eady and TJD. But if I'm giving it to one guy today, it's Trace Jackson Davis, over three blocks a game. He's, he can guard all positions on the floor. We talk about his offense, but defensively, he's, he's phenomenal. So let me just clarify. You have Caleb McConnell now as fourth 
in the Big Ten Defensive Player <laughs> Look, he, of the he's Year He's fantastic, rankings. but I think those other three guys have emerged, and, and Audija has totally turned around their team. He's been the catalyst. He is the best defensive player on Rutgers. I, I, would, I would buy this. I think TJD is terrific. I would buy Caleb okay. McConnell. I just okay. think he's so good that people have forgotten how good he is. If that makes any that's, sense, they just expect warranted. him to that, be unbelievably warranted. locked down every game, yeah. and, he, and he pretty much is. All right, buy or sell Bryce Sensabaugh as the Big Ten freshman of the year. Now, a month ago, this was a given, right? He's been the front runner. I think sometimes the narrative early on in seasons it can it can just carry throughout, and it hurts me to do this. Look, averaging over 18 a game, he's shooting 50 percent from the field, 46 percent from three, 80 percent from the free throw. I, I sense there's a but coming, time. but I'm selling it. Okay. I'm giving this to Jalen Hood Shafino. I think he's emerging, especially if I'm buying. I mean, I think that the stock on his he freshman year is a little bit lower now for Hood Shafino. But I look at the team success, and I'm not a guy that says, hey, the, it should be the best freshman on the best team. But it's a different ball game when you're putting up Hood Shafino's numbers over 14 a game and doing it at a, with a contender. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's just about being on a good team. But Ohio State, yeah, yeah, yeah. their struggles, yeah. they are so deep in the conference standings, and they have struggled so much that I think it does take something away it's from Sensabaugh's chance yep. to win that award. I'm with you. I like JHS to win freshman of the year. Okay, buy or sell, and this one's tough because you have to look at the entire schedule. Purdue will lose at least two more games before the Big Ten tournament, so two more regular season losses for Purdue, buy or sell. My first reaction was, I'm buying this because I think they're going to drop some more. But then I looked at their schedule. Their away games are at Northwestern, Maryland, Wisconsin. I think more winnable than some of their home games coming up against Illinois, Indiana. Look, they can beat anyone, obviously. But I just I think that schedule is favorable for them. I think they're going to drop one more game. I don't think they're going to drop two more games. I have some of the same concerns as you as them. As good as they are, as good as I love the freshman backcourt, teams that really get after them, that can be aggressive, that are athletic and quick, I think can cause them problems, but, man, they're playing really well. And I only have them losing one more game in conference So if you're going to pick one of those games, you said it's Northwestern, Maryland, Wisconsin on the road. They have Illinois, Indiana, and someone else left at home. And Iowa left at home. They have all the eyes left at home. If they're going to lose one of those games, which one do they drop? Oh, one game? Well, you said they're going to lose one more game. I think think Illinois at home, last game of the season, might be it. Um, if I'm choosing one, I'm probably going with that one. Well, maybe they have the number one seed locked up. I don't know how I that feel point. about it's, that. It's like Maryland will be a tough Matt, one on the road. Matt too. Painter decides to rest his starters yeah. to get him ready. Maybe that's it for the Big Ten tournament. For Trent Meacham, I'm Rick Pizzo. Had a lot of fun on Big Ten today. We are back same time on Wednesday. Until then, enjoy your day. Have a great one, everybody. <laughs>